is 18. Panel, the invisible hand has failed us once again. The Paris Agreement is doing more harm than good. We are neglecting eight boundaries because governments have no incentives to care, and this highway to hell that we're on is turning into the autobahn where speed limits do not exist. Three things in my speech. First of all, why do we care about the boundaries? Second of all, why does the, why does the use of the non-planetary boundaries framework lead to more public support? And third of all, why do we get better policies? Some framing. The nine planetary boundary system are, uh, identifies nine boundaries that are environmental processes that must be regulated to ensure our future. This looks like, for example, biodiversity loss. Why should you or I care? Well, if all we've been fed for the last few years was a climate goal, it might seem kind of counterintuitive that this isn't the only main focus of the environmental movement. Let me give you a direct example, though. The nitrogen cycle, for example, which I don't believe the average voter knows about. Panel, the use of fertilizers spikes the amount of nitrogen in soil and water. When nitrogen spikes, algaes grow. When algaes, uh, when algaes die out, oxygen levels decrease significantly. This means that fish and other species die out, we get less Point. food, and people die. No, thank you. This leads to the next boundary, biodiversity. Every single animal plays a distinct role in our ecosystem. At the rate at which species are dying out, we are going to witness unforeseeable changes to, that, uh, to our ecosystem that threaten our, existence. The, uh, that threaten our existence. The important thing to clarify here, panel, is that the graph shows indicators that once in the red don't directly mean that the tipping point, which leads to uh, irreversible change, uh, has already been hit, right? Being in the red means that the current levels are not sustainable and will hit the tipping point if they continue like this. For example, biodiversity loss is measured in the rate of species that go extinct every single day. If this indicator is in the red for a much longer period of time, like for example right now we're losing 150 species a day, we will reach a tipping point of no return because our ecosystems are screwed over. This means that nihilism and states of panic are unlikely solely because of the implementation of this model, right? It, it is possible to get things back. What is our stance? We support the global implementation of boundaries, and we support boundaries for individual countries. Looks like downscaling, right? We believe that every country should focus on staying in bounds within their own limits, as well as those countries uh, putting in extra work who have been the cause of excess harms to the environment before. So these are usually the developed nations who have put in, uh, who have uh, harmed the environment. No, thank you. Uh, what does our world look like? It looks like, first of all, environmental movements, news, schools, uh, using graphical representation, right? Everybody around the world can read a red, yellow, and green light. But most crucially, we see it as realistic that companies will uh, use these boundaries to assess each decision they make and each product they release, right? So no, so no matter what their business is, they will be asked to assess their impact on each of the nine boundaries. Similarly, government policies will do the same, right? Weighing every decision in these nine categories, even if these decisions don't affect them at all, this means that these nine categories become a common framework for everybody for policy making globally and nationally. What is the counterfactual, right? Because opposition needs to defend the status quo. What does this look like? This looks like, first of all, international conferences, such as the Conference of the Parties, primarily emphasizing the uh, importance of staying with a, a 1.5 degree limit. This means that the general public tends to associate environmental changes primarily with temperature fluctuations, which is, first of all, simply not the case. And second of all, and this is extremely important, panel, the cheapest and therefore most likely policy for the US that actually meets the Paris two degree target still transgresses five out of eight planetary boundaries. By narrowing the focus purely on global warming, we are killing the environment even faster, right? There's no economic incentives, there's no incentives at all for governments to tend to other boundaries. The awareness is not enough because people don't care about the impacts of climate change until they feel them, because there's no common consensus on the tipping point. The, 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 these tipping points of 1.5 or 2 degrees uh, uh, already were forgotten. No one cares because no one, especially in the uh, economically strongest countries, is feeling any results. The introduction of this model means that the people finally reach a consensus on the impacts of our actions that will lead to us reaching more tipping points. Whatever is in the red needs to be prioritized, right? Companies aren't being held responsible on opposition for their actions and are causing further harms to the system because even with a carbon tax and a cap and trade model, they can still use, they can still cause huge harms to our ecosystem, right? Capitalism is screwing us because even if we restrict these companies' emissions, these companies will continue using up the world's resources like they're abundant and cause greater harms elsewhere. My first argument then on public support before any POIs. The nine planetary boundaries framework was proposed more than two decades ago, and yet the international scientific community still does not recognize it as a legitimate strategy. 
at this crucial point in the climate crisis, why are you willing to back a speculative solution of the real world efforts that are currently happening? Standing on the shoulders of a giant is still, you're still taller than a giant, right? We're building on a framework, we're building on like research. This entire framework is built on research that was already made, right? And it has gotten adaptions ever since 2009. So this doesn't mean that it can't change, it doesn't mean that it doesn't, can't get better. This is like, this is also like, this is something we obviously support, right? Okay, my first argument on public support. People right now have a choice. Either A, you lower your impact on global warming, or B, you do not support the environmental movement. On our side, individuals are empowered to make consumer level changes that are closest to them. Everybody can help in one of these boundaries, right? There are no excuses anymore. Everyone can be held accountable. Like, for example, if you have to drive to work every single day because you have no other choice but doing so, right? Because there's no public transportation and you can't use a bike because it's an hour away, right? You don't have a choice. But when you're giving these people more alternatives, more options to contribute to the environment, you're allowing them to take part easier and not giving them any excuses when any of their friends ask them why they aren't doing something. This looks like people supporting biodiversity and pollution reduction efforts by purchasing meat from sustainable sources. This looks like composting organic waste. This looks like reducing the use of single-use items, right? This, uh, our model, uh, the, the, the framework can also help combat feelings of hopelessness by emphasizing areas where progress has been made or where positive change is possible, right? For example, the ozone layer was in the red area, is now back in the green. Okay, you might say that, ah, but then people get complacent and get a false sense of security when something is green. First of all, I want to see how this is different in the counterfactual. Second of all, once it's red or yellow, this doesn't apply. Third of all, contrast these little victories with the fact that things like the 1.5 degree target were already thrown away, right? And we encourage a stronger norm shift in our side of the house, where, influence, where individuals influence each other to adopt environmentally friendly practices. Why? Because we're uh, broadening the scope of a movement that is literally responsible for our future. Panel, the nine planetary boundary system is extremely good at ensuring that everyone can participate in the things that are nearest to them. The metric here is who's able to create better incentives for, peop uh, for the average consumer to change their habits and act more environmentally friendly. If people can choose and don't need to restructure their entire lives, if everyone helps where, where they can and don't have to choose between supporting the environment, no thank you, and not supporting the environment like they do in the status quo, where it's a choice between either being a green person or not being a green person, it is possible to raise general awareness levels and shift societal norms. My second argument on better policy. Panel note that countries right now are refusing policy changes because stopping their economies and restructuring them is not worth it. Companies aren't focusing on the nine boundaries because it is not worth it. There's no accountability measures and there's no incentive for them to do so. They aren't putting in the right policies and weasel out of problems because they don't want to harm GDP growth. And because we haven't set up the right accountability measures, we need to stop the prioritization of GDP growth. This works in two ways. First of all, bottom up because of the public awareness that I explained in the first argument. Second of all, we make politicians actively care more and we give them incentives. This is top down, right? This approach ensures that policymakers cannot evade or downplay pressing issues such as the availability of fresh water around the world as there's a clear framework that encompasses all of these concerns. Panel, if temperatures rise by three degrees, 40% of the earth is uninhabitable, ha inhabitable, which means that if you put it in terms simply of climate, 60% of the world have no incentive to keep their global warming low. However, every part of the world is affected by at least one, uh, one boundary. So on our side, we're making climate-friendly politics more likely. Panel, the status quo is not sufficient. The nine planetary boundary framework is raising awareness. So proud to propose. <laughs> for eight minutes and 12 seconds. So just may we proceed with your next speaker? Okay. May we now have the first speaker from the opposition to begin their case? Is it all right if I speak at this volume? Yes. As the climate deadline rapidly encroaches upon humanity's survival, we no longer have the privilege of aspiring for a perfect planet, only a livable one. 
The poor responses are to set up two things. One, instead of an ecological framework built on the nine planetary boundaries, we prefer a world where decarbonization is at the forefront of international environmental policy. Note, this does not mean we're in objection to the protection of the eight other boundaries. In fact, the status quo is composed of diverse NGOs and private civil society groups who continue the protection of the planet's other boundaries, such as the WWF protecting ecosystems. What this debate calls for is a deprioritization of the nine planetary boundaries on a federal level, and thus, an international focus on decarbonization and public policy, green innovation, and more. Secondly, resources and political capital are finite on both sides. As such, their drastic global shift necessitates an equally drastic reappropriation of resources, which are currently being funneled towards decarbonization. Crucially, the framework of the nine planetary boundaries attempts to address nine distinct aspects of the environment simultaneously, whereas decarbonization only requires a concentrated effort in one area. Therefore, Proposition's burden in this debate is to demonstrate why their policy, which is systematically more time and resource intensive, will succeed under a paradigm of impending climate catastrophe. Before arguments, a few responses. Three things. One. I would like to note that all the signs that Proposition gives in that first speech is precisely why the public on their side would need to drastically change their way of life. Because if it's true that consumption is extremely excessive, that chemical fertilizers are destroying the land, all of this cannot exist under their paradigm because it will further exacerbate harms towards the planet. The burden they then take is that, oh, you know what, we just need to do things like downscale. But I'd like to note this is an extremely soft line of them to take on. Because if their characterization is true, that the world that they characterize is already doing too much devastation, what they must do in order to limit this devastation is dictate to individuals how exactly you should live your life. So we think that actually the flip is true, there'll be more resentment on their side. Because if you allow individuals to pick and choose, likely they're not going to opt into the things that help reduce devastation the most. You need to give them strict requirements to meet. Secondly, they say that we're destroying the other boundaries under our paradigm. Why? This is pretty much asserted. There's absolutely no illustration as to how we're destroying it. But I'd just like to examine the reason why we focus on temperature increases to begin with. It was because for decades, the global scientific community agreed that temperature rises was the thing that was destroying all other boundaries of the planet, which is why we needed to focus on it when it came to international environmental policy. As our case will prove, insofar as decarbonization is the way to go, we can actually pull all their harms. Lastly, they said that companies aren't doing enough. Note, panel, capitalism is still going to exist on their side. They don't explain how exactly it's going to be changed, but I see that the flip is powers on their side. Corporations on their side now are allowed to excuse their greenwashing because when you can just not use fertilizers but still emit carbon, you're still harming the planet, but in fact, you give them the opt-out for companies to continue with their bad behavior. That needs to change only on our side till we get it. Two arguments. One, on how the nine planetary boundaries fatally shift the priority of international environmental protection, and two, why proposition engineers a political landmine that eviscerates the possibility of a green transition. On the first argument, firstly, not the boundaries are insufficient in overcoming environmental degradation. So I'd like to just challenge their science a little bit here. The UN-led IPCC, which is the body that fights against climate change, has placed decarbonization as the utmost priority for environmental preservation. Why? Science has warned us in less than two decades, we will enter a climate apocalypse, a product of rising temperatures caused by carbon emissions. And to avoid this, we need to do things like cut emissions by 45% by 2030. But the issue is that current rates of reduction indicate we're nowhere close to achieving that goal. So the planetary boundaries on their side nearly distract us from concentrating our full efforts on survival. In contrast, the IPCC rejected the ability of the planetary boundaries to function as benchmarks for human survival. In fact, three out of the nine boundaries on their side aren't even quantifiable because scientists have yet to develop an accurate method to measure the degradation, so they would waste resources on their side into undeveloped scientific theory that we cannot implement immediately. Secondly, conversely, we think it's empirically true that carbon emissions are the largest factor underpinning no. the well-being of most ecosystems. Thus, reducing carbon is the prerequisite to the protection of the other boundaries. Why? The rise in carbon emissions catalyzes the climate catastrophe because, for instance, Climate change is the primary factor contributing to things like biodiversity loss that they point up when extreme weather patterns do things like kill species. But the issue is that when they focus on individualistic policies like dealing with ocean acidification in isolation, they merely deal with a symptom of rising carbon emissions, but never the root cause, which is the fact that we are emitting too much carbon. Therefore, reducing carbon emissions is the only unifying solution that tackles the most strategic majority of factors that lead to environmental decay. Lastly, 
That policy actually squanders limited resources on ineffective solutions at the expense of existing decarbonization policies. Why? One, their policies are inherently more resource intensive because note, they want to have nine boundaries so you invest in a wider range of nascent technology, betting billions on advancements that may never happen. Conversely, we utilize the robust framework of green technology which is built on decades of investment and research. But more importantly, the success of these policies requires a concentration of resources that can only exist on up. For instance, we invest more than two trillion to overhaul the fossil fuel industry in order to transition to sustainable energy, but they would rather spend it on doing things like banning chemical fertilizers. Before I get into the second argument, sure. How are you telling us that there are things that we don't know about certain boundaries and then telling us in the same speech that there are that we know for sure that climate change is the most important one? So all this debate takes place on the existing research we have. What we are saying is that ours is more aligned to what we ought to do. You still need to spend time investigating how exactly you're going to implement your framework. There was no mechanizing in P1 speech. Second argument as to why proposition engineers a political landmine that eviscerates the possibility of a green transition. Note that adopting the planetary boundaries necessitates a vast reappropriation of resources that sabotages our current efforts of carbon reductions. What their strategy does is it destroys planetary survival because it incites multifaceted hostility against the environmental movement, and this will deal with why they don't actually get good policies. One, Proposition resets decades of political efforts by abruptly upending the strategy of the environmental movement. What they need to realize is that all the successes earned by the green movement today were fought over decades of political battles and they were uniquely overcome using the policy platform of decarbonization. The right wing and fiscal conservatives are already innately opposed to any resource intensive green policies and that's why they engage in many scientific research to question the credibility of climate change to begin with. The movement then has expanded every resource available to prove that our entire survival is contingent on reducing carbon emissions. Now, as soon as we achieve a scientific consensus, what they want to do is re-enter a new scientific battleground and repeat this process. Here's what they need to do. They'll have to reconvince the entire voter base that everything we knew about the climate safety point is false and you need to follow this new framework. Not only are they going to fail to do this in time, they'll also decry and convolute the decarbonization movement at the same time. So what this proves is that the nine planetary boundaries won't be able to do things like piggyback off of the success of existing agreements because their demands are fundamentally different to ours. Less secondly, proposition provokes industry-wide resistance towards a green economy because the ideological rigor of the nine boundaries makes their world entirely unprofitable for key industries and economies. The only reason why reforms are successful on our side was because we got aligned profit with sustainability. But on their side, every solution that might strike a balance between profit and the climate also inevitably betrays another boundary. For example, if you want to research circulate cement, it destroys land systems. So what this proves is that it undercuts their ability to get the ambitious change they want because even if we take their best case, they need to trade off something. Proposition's policy only succeeds in turning the most powerful echelons of society against the movement and because the global problem requires a global solution, they decimate all hope for the salvation of humanity. Thank you. Just spoke for 8 minutes and se 17 seconds. Judges, may we proceed with the next speaker? Okay, may we now have the second speaker from the proposition to continue the game? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. <clears throat> Pan, a 60-year-old politician cares more about a nice career and growing the GDP than finding the best long-term solution to help the planet. Why? Because in 15 years, he will be dead anyway. On proposition, we give him an incentive not to find the cheapest, but the best solution uh, to save our planet, one uh, that doesn't do more harm than good so far to propose. Before I come to the point I just um, mentioned uh, in my own argument, uh, let me go into the four main clashes um, uh, of this debate, but before, uh, two quick points on clarification. First, it's not actually that time and resource incentive, uh, it, um, um, it, like, um, uh, expensive uh, to actually implement uh, this model, right? Because it's one single graph. You look at one single graph and you can see where we are standing on uh, all of the planetary issues. And it's very easy to understand. Everybody knows how traffic lights work. Um, you have a clear traffic light system telling us, look, in the red zone, um, it's going really bad. In the green zone, we are okay. Also, people understand things very, very quickly. It won't take very long to implement this, right? It only took a few months, for example, on the COVID policies. And now everybody knows about graphs like mortality rate, um, amounts of the cases, or ICU occupancy rate. No, thank you. Uh, so on to the main questions. First, on awareness. Second, on attention. Third, on consumers. And fourth, on climate change denial. On attention. Opposition tells us two things here. First, that attention is diverted away from climate change, which they claim is the most important thing. And then second, they tell us that if you tackle the climate, you tackle uh, all of the other boundaries, right? 
But the thing is, um, they, they uh, for example, also talk about uh, the concentration of resources. But the concentration, like, um, but right now, no, we are not, no, thank you, uh, using all of the resources we could. We get more resources on our side because people see wh a wider range of solutions, and especially because the richer, developing, uh, developed countries that can do the most are now finally impacted and see the clear impact on our side of the house. And climate policies, uh, politics are currently done in game theory. Uh, countries don't want to restructure their industrial economies, but we give them as an alternative to do so. Also, countries focusing on, uh, glo on global warming at the moment will continue to do so. But countries that don't uh, have to re uh, countries that don't have to reconstruct the economy will keep working on this because of the accountability mechs on climate change that are still given on our side. Climate change is still one of the nine planetary boundaries. Then they tell us like that other boundaries uh, like that, that, that uh, this is the most important boundary. But other boundaries are just as important. I'll get into a few examples in a minute. If your house is on fire panels and the tree falls on it as well, it's not enough to just lift the tree up. You also have because your right. house is still on fire. That is the way our planet looks right now. No, thank you. Um, okay, then I'll introduce two examples on the other boundaries right here. Right, first on biodiversity. It's much further in the red zone than climate. The alarm bells are, should be ringing much louder, but they aren't. Um, if even one single species line can destroy a whole ecosystem, because an ecosystem is like a chain, when you remove one link, the whole chain suddenly breaks apart. Um, it's vital for our survival that we have biodiversity, because we need bees, for example, to grow food, and soon in 2046, uh, no more fish will be in the ocean. So on the nitrogen cycle, it's much further in the red thing, uh, on the climate change right now. We have too, if we have too much climate and, and nitrogen, uh, the water is contaminated too little to the crop side. No, thank you. Um, also, we want to um, get re new research into, the, into improving this boundary system on their side of the house. We can only have this on our side of the house because on only our side does the nine planetary boundaries framework actually get attention. Also, um, we can't completely solve these issues just by attacking climate change, right? Even without, cli even without climate change, we are still killing species by using pesticides. We are still chopping down the rain uh, uh, rainforest, and we're still harming the nitrogen uh, cycle by overfertilizing. And fresh water is still a problem because we are using too much of it. Even if uh, climate, uh, uh, the climate change seems more efficient, we uh, no, I. no, thank you. Um, we tackle uh, um, uh, like um, even if uh, you do a climate change measure on our side, it actually seems um, more important, like more efficient because you tackle several problems at once. You can claim that uh, it, we're not just uh, tackling climate change, but also helping against biodiversity. Um, so you actually get more support against it, uh, to more support because it seems more efficient. Also, we have in, so we have increased support uh, for planet health in general, uh, as we said in our first argument, and we don't have any state solutions, as I will come to in my own argument, um, and this is the status quo, where, um, like, uh, which in the status quo helps, uh, which helps the climate, which we're doing right now. Okay, on to awareness. Uh, they told us uh, the two, like, two things of response they gave us on our awareness point, how we're getting more and more awareness for the other issues. The first they tell us it's unscientific, right? But the reason we aren't adopting uh, this uh, thing right now is because of the media climate focus, not because it's like uh, incredibly unscientific. The science community is just still cares about the media focus right now. We on our side change that. Uh, because we told you in our first speech we will have media attention on our side. That's one of the ways we gave you to implement this. You just completely ignore that, right? Um, also, this thing is made by leading climate, like leading planetary scientists. Um, and people are changing, even if it's not scientific. People changing isn't based on facts. They feel that there's a freshwater problem. They feel that there are biodiversity issues. So even if it were unscientific, taking them on their very highest ground, people still feel the problems, even if we can't exactly and depict them. Also, um, no, I. Then, no, thank you. Then they told us, like, oh, hey, um, they don't, like, they don't object and like uh, how we have like the diverse NGOs right now, but the NGOs right now are ignored because we only focus on the climate, often to the cost of other issues, as I will talk more in my argument. On to consumers. They tell us um, for consumer level change, we need policies, which is much more important. But um, a, a, a fertilizer policy on our side, which would help with the nitrogen cycle, is extremely unpopular on their side because nobody cares about it, because nobody knows this is an issue. And no one cares about the climate right now because they don't feel um, the, Im uh, the impact uh, on our side. They actually feel the impact of things like the nitrogen cycle and uh, fresh water, uh, like a lack of fresh water. Also on climate change deniers, they told us, oh, it will be so much easier for deniers. But it's harder to deny because you directly see See the impact, especially in the um, developed countries that are both the most harmful to the environment right now, but could do the most, we will have less climate change than ours, and our side actually we flip this point. On to my own argument on preventive state solutions. Canon diplomacy is that the public is aware of the importance of other issues and can, no thank you, uh, understand how something impacts them. They just they see more impact than just the climate. The problem in the status quo is that we often get paid solutions. Um, they seem to help on climate change, but actually harm the planet much more on other boundaries. 
often the politicians aren't even aware of the impact of the less known parts of this framework. But, uh, like, for instance, megadams to produce carbon neutral energy. But we completely ignore the biodiversity issues that arise when fish can't pass the dam, dam for breeding anymore, uh, and the fact that sediment can't pass through, causing not only biodiversity issues, but also harming the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle downstream. Uh, for instance, the Ethiopia Dam project is causing mass, uh, massive ecosystem problems in the Nile uh, because no more sediment is passing, which means that millions of people are, uh, that are dependent downstream on, uh, no, thank you, um, this uh, sediment for food, um, it's very difficult for, to farm and jeopardizing. Um, and jeopardizing their food supply. Um, often we need only small safeguards um, just so that it isn't harmful, but it takes a little extra effort of the politicians, I think, to pass a small regulatory policy. This engages um, with their points uh, that they contradict each other. Right now, yes, they are contradicting each other because we are not passing these small safeguards, but we have the technology to do so. Uh, for, for instance, recycling water in factories or filtering air after battery production in VW factories, or installing ways for fish and sediment to pass hydroelectric dams by using in stream turbines. Even if the politicians know about the problems of place solutions right now, they just ignore this because there's no pressure on them from the public uh, to act because the public doesn't really care. Why then is this harmful? Because we have a false sense of solving an issue when we are creating more. We think that we are solving the climate uh, crisis, but actually depriving millions of the fresh water and food. At best, we create as much of an issue as we sow, but then we still have the problem that we're unaware of the issue, so we're unlikely to attack this. How do we solve this? We're likely to A, get institutionalized checks, so now with every policy, we actually check uh, like not just on the climate, but on the broader planetary issues like biodiversity. And secondly, the journalists and activists can now easily shine light on issues because the general public cares so and they're actually educated more than just the climate. For, for instance, the immense harm of VW factories or megadams is now much clearer. So the public issue not to prevent fake solutions and at the very least take the extra effort and implement the safeguards. Thus, we get federal policies on our side so far to propose both propositions. The speakers spoke for eight minutes and 13 seconds. Judges, may we proceed with the next speaker? Yeah. Also, this is Bowen de Wuhan. Yeah. <laughs> may we now have the second speaker from opposition, which is Elizabeth Rodriguez. Thank you, Judge Bowen. Proposition's framework was nothing more than an environmental distraction that would ultimately bring our planet to destruction. The problem with Team Germany's case is they do not fulfill their burden in this debate. We agree that there are multifaceted problems in the climate crisis, but they never explain why the solution is a strict policy framework that will inevitably take away limited resources from the primary evil of carbon emissions. There's one large clarification I want to make about the two teams in this debate. One, that this debate is a comparison between two strategies. Firstly, on opposition, where we support an upward improving trend of status quo, where we already successfully concentrate resources on reducing carbon emissions. But what proposition needs to do is a deviation from this strategy, where now you not only have to take away resources from this, but you have the additional burden of convincing the masses about these problems, formulating new policies to deal with the issues they want to face. So their burden was to weigh why these eight other planetary boundaries are of equal significance in threat that justifies taking away billions of the limited resources we have to fight a time-urgent issue. What we explained was that these problems do exist, but we accounted for this in two distinct ways. First, we already have niche civil society groups, scientific bodies, who are already fighting the harms of the issues like biodiversity loss and land reform usage. So what they have to like, account for in this debate is why these are insufficient, given that climate resources are overall limited, and therefore we have to prioritize the issue that's the largest. But secondarily, we also explain why reducing carbon emissions means you reduce the other problems that exist, which is true that biodiversity loss is going to happen anyways, but given that we reduce a large majority of the carbon emissions, means the threat that comes of biodiversity loss is also reduced, meaning the worst accesses of harm that they want to talk about are effectively out of the debate, but they don't engage with our largest harms, which is about why carbon emissions would destroy us all. Three issues in this speech. First, on the policy priority of environmental reform. Secondly, on political and economic blowback. And thirdly, my extension on why the planetary boundaries framework threatens survival, the survival of vulnerable groups. Let's deal with the first, the policy priority of environmental reform. Once again, I want to draw attention to this, which they don't respond to. 
Why is carbon emissions the most important policy priority? First, because it builds off years of research, decades of scientific consensus for the IPCC and other big bodies that proves that most of the resources are going into this, where you get buy-in and participation from governments. Secondly, it's the most resource-intensive issue to solve. You need carbon capture technology, green oil innovation, solar panels that allow you to transition away from fossil fuels. So given it's the largest of the issues to solve, you need to concentrate this as the biggest problem, and you cannot let other issues get in the way. But thirdly, more carbon emission actually worsens the other planetary boundaries. For example, the existence of more emissions leads to global warming, which affects ecosystems, increases ocean acidification. So to prove why this is the most important priority, they cannot be discarded on their side. What do they respond with? First, they say, yes, the science is imperfect now, but we can build on it over time. The problem is that both sides agree that the climate crisis is imminent, so it means we need these urgent fixes and speculative science does more harm than good. For instance, if the science on chemical fertilizers is imperfect, there's millions of dollars on the other side going into imperfect policies and faulty regulations that they have to fix later on. We have to pour more resources to mend over time, which is money lost that could have otherwise gone into investing into green technology. Secondly, they cannot get away with their incredibly soft burden of saying it just raises awareness. That sounds an awful lot like our side on status quo where we focus on carbon reductions in our policy but we don't have to say that these problems don't exist on their side. If all they are doing is here's a graph then there's really not much impact in this debate which is why second prop's clarification is damaging for their case and reduces their impact. But second, I want to talk about why there's going to be huge amounts of political and economic blowback. So this directly clashes their second argument on getting public support. We explain political buy-in was crucial because we require mass amounts of will in order to fund green technologies, to invest in climate summits, to research policies like tax credits. But what happens is when you say that here are huge amounts of other regulations you have to follow, which are ultimately less important for the environment, it comes at a trade-off that now makes these companies less likely to cooperate with you. Their response was on the individuals, right? Which is that actually now people can contribute in many ways by eating less meat. We have a few key responses. One. This is a terrible example for the other side because we already encourage veganism in the status quo on the grounds of carbon right. emissions because the meat industry emits billions of tons of carbon every year. So this is an argument for individual participation in the part of the environmental movement to rhetoric. It's not an argument for nine planetary boundaries which can also get on our side to the framework of saying this is how you can reduce your carbon. But secondly, I want to break the deadlock because the other side says we get more people to buy in, our side says more people can will, will opt out. But what actually happens here is even if you're able to say I'm they reduce in one way, which is that I don't use freshwater bodies anymore. The problem with the other side is because you want to be so holistic, you, you discredit individuals' contributions. You say, even if you eat less meat, that's not enough because you're still violating the eight other you're planetary right. boundaries on the other side. So yes, some people may get credited, but you discredit them even more on your side because they say, well, you're only doing one thing. You're not doing everything you can to help the environment. That's why people are turned away. Finally, first off, flips this accidentally. If you say it's easier for consumers to discharge their environmental responsibility, it's also easiest for companies to dodge their responsibility which is why it's worse on their side and specifically companies can just hijack this scientific consensus because it's new, it's nascent and it's harder for you to hold them accountable. When companies will still see the impact more clearly on our side because they are because the companies that are harming most in the developed uh, developed countries will actually feel the pressure of fresh water not being there. Uh, so the problem with this is that you assume that the companies are then have an equal incentive to solve this. What we deal in the second argument is that it proves huge amounts of blowback. So even if there's good policies, you give ammunition for them to say, look at the environmental movement. You're trying to focus on problems that don't exist. You're trying to threaten human survival, which is very nicely into the third argument about how the nine planetary boundaries excessively punishes vulnerable communities by threatening their survival. The premise of this argument is that with 8 billion people on Earth, there's a certain amount of planetary consumption that will be necessary in order to sustain human life. Prop's framework protects the planet in a vacuum in their best case, but does not consider the human cost that comes with it. What we explain is that preservation of the planet is not only a means to an end, but the ultimate goal being the protection of humanity. If we prove that their policy comes at the direct cost of groups who rely on natural resources for their livelihoods, then we have proven that the planetary boundaries is counterproductive to its own goals. So two ways we do this. First, this framework imposes an unrealistic and overly punitive restriction on the use of resources for human development. But there are vulnerable countries who rely on planetary resources in a fundamental, irreplaceable way. First, cultivating large monocultures of fish is crucial to guaranteeing food security in areas with growing scarcity, especially the global south. So communities need a surplus of food to survive increasingly unpredictable weather and volatile food harvest. Under their framework, they would have to greatly limit such monocultures, decimating food supply and leaving people to starve. Next example is that severe restrictions on land use prevent farmers from expanding farmland in order to grow more crops. With less produce to sell on the market, the already meager incomes of poor farmers shrinks even more, so 
plunge them further into poverty. In contrast, on opposition, we're not just going to allow unlimited plunder, but what we'll be okay with is measures like carbon offsetting, which allows communities to utilize resources they need to survive, but reabsorb the carbon they emit in alternative ways, or transition to sustainable fishing and farming. Their side can't do that because you place overly punitive restrictions on them. Second, this framework obstructs the creation of preventative measures in response to imminent climate threats. For example, day by day, the need to establish robust water distribution systems becomes more urgent. For instance, in Morocco, massive pipelines from the north to Casablanca in the south supply over 6 million people with clean water. However, intervention in these freshwater bodies on the other side constitutes planetary damage and this would not exist because you say it harms the environment even if it's necessary for human survival. In order to deal with the fluctuating availability of water, dams are created to, remain, to conserve remaining freshwater sources, which may reduce biodiversity, but it's necessary to protect people. Given their harsh restrictions, they will need to ban this too. The conclusion is simple. Crops will engineers immediate devastation to communities whose lives are deeply intertwined with the land they live on. Any help they bring to the environment is ultimately fruitless for it comes to the expense of humanity. We are exceedingly proud to oppose. We first spoke for eight minutes and 16 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. So we will proceed with the next speaker. May we now have the third speaker from the proposition team to deliver the speech. We feel apathetic about environmental changes is based on simple psychology. The optimism bias makes us neglect the severity of the issue as long as it's not for us being diagnosed with cancer due to chemical pollution. At the same time, we don't believe that we have the power to change because climate challenge seems so insurmountable on their side when you only have to hit this 1.5 degree number. The solution to this is based on a simple carrot and stick method. We make people aware of the traffic light turning red and them stopping in the middle of the street, but we also tell them that we have high chances of them not being pushed by a car if they move a little bit quicker to get to the side, to get to the opposite side of the street, because in the end of the day, you at least have nine planetary boundaries. You can choose either of them to fix. You don't have to only focus on this one target, which neglects the differences of regions and neglects the differences, difference in needs for individuals. What am I going to do in my speech? Four things. First, on the effectiveness of the framework and the effectiveness of resource allocation. Second, on the support for environmental action. On that two points, first on buy-in and second on the incentive to act, then on political change. And know that this is our independent path to victory, right? Because our benefits here set regardless of the awareness and the urge to act, as long as people know that these boundaries exist, politicians can pick and choose from one of these issues and decide on to fix this one issue because on either side of the house people care about climate change it's just about like the threshold of action right in the end of the day i'm still going to talk about corporations first of all some clarifications first they said that we cannot pick and choose and need to strictly require people i don't think this is true because this is the basis of our model right that you have nine different issues and some of them have different urgency some of them are in the red area some of them are in the green area so you definitely need to prioritize one of them on one of these issues but even if they want us to defend like tackling all problems in all regions yeah, at the I... same time no thank you we're still okay with that because we think all nine different issues are equally important then the, the biggest strategic flaw here is that they tell you that oh um you need to uh, build a lot of you need to have a lot of new research you need to have a lot of uh, new resources directed into investing investing new methods to tackle one of these nine issues. I think this is a big strategic flaw, right? Because they also tell you that they have NGOs in the status quo that are already tackling this problem. That also means that the solutions already exist in the status quo. We already have solutions on fresh water and biodiversity. The only crucial 
Delta then on both sides is that they are not prioritizing these issues because they only focus on the 1.5 degree goal, which people have already given up on since that we have surpassed this for so long. On our side, these solutions are prioritized and implemented. This is not about research and development. Now first, onto the effectiveness of the framework. The idea they give you here is that if we tackle one problem, that is the climate change problem, we tackle all problems because decarbonization is so important based on some empirical you know studies. No, thank you. We also tell you in our very first speech why this is equally important, right? We like to flip this. Climate change is the result of all nine planetary areas and all the harms added together. If you don't fix all these problems, you cannot fix climate change either. We already tell you in our very first speech when Vince tells you, even if they achieve the 1.5 degrees Paris Agreement, we're still going to cross uh, five of these nine planetary boundaries. That still doesn't solve the problem. But also, this debate is about nuances, right? Not every region has the same problems and has the same capacity to fix the problem. That means on their side, developing nations are also forced to only tackle decarbonization that cannot happen when they strictly rely on industry, when they cannot give up this economic sector because they, were, they are so reliant on this. We think on our side, you at least then get some changes if they can change some freshwater issues or issues on biodiversity and don't have to opt into something that, that there is like not beneficial for them, that politicians are never able to pass because they have so much like uh, capital coming from uh, companies, you have so much lobbying against this. We're, we think it's better to get some change than non-change in these uh, areas. And also, like they also tell us that okay, countries are currently like that. Countries that are currently focusing on climate, we think that these countries can continue focusing on climate because this is also one of the planetary boundaries. But at the same time, we believe that countries who don't want to restructure the economy can focus on other issues because in the end of the day, that's still better POI. than focusing on something they cannot tackle. Before going on, I'll take a POI. So your side argues that all nine boundaries are important, yet at the same time, you want individuals to pick and choose what policy they can pursue. Why not make all of them do it at the same time? The problem here is that the reason why we have this boundary is because we see regional and individual differences, right? Because in some countries, you might not even have that much climate, in, uh, like uh, carbon emissions, but you have harms on biodiversity, you have harms on freshwater. This means you can pick and choose from these nine planetary boundaries. We never push the burden onto ourselves that we need to defend nine boundaries simultaneously, even if some of them are in the green area. We do think that you need some sort of prioritization, but we think that prioritization is better if you can choose from these nine issues and not only focusing on this one carbon problem. Now, onto the research towards allocation. I already rebutted that in my clarification that this is not about research and development because you already have existing solutions. This is about implementation and prioritization. Onto my first clash on the support. This uh, comes down to first buy-in and second, the incentive to act. Now on buy-in, they tell you that you need a lot of new support because you have new policies that um, you have already existing attention and you somehow cannot build on that attention. We think this is simply ridiculous, right? In the status quo, we already have general awareness for climate change. We think we can use the attention that is already directed to the green movement in turning into the, like on these niche issues then, because if you already care about climate change, it's quite likely that you're also going to care about freshwater and biodiversity once you know the urgency of this problem. And they also tell you that you have more anti-climate movement on our side because like you're so focused on climate before now it's difficult to prove why other issues are also important. Let me flip this panel. People have a fight and flight instinct. Anti-climate movements are anti-climate because they think this is a far too difficult task that they cannot fix. This is why they choose to fly. This is why they choose to disregard this problem. This problem only exists on their side of the house because fixing carbon means that you need to trade off your economy to a certain extent. That means this uh, This is why people are so extreme. This is why people perceive this model as too extreme and don't want to opt into this model. You don't get that on our side of the house where you don't see these challenges as insurmountable and you can have smaller changes in e either of these areas. And when the threshold here is not absolute, but you can pick and choose from one of these issues to fix, we think that is far more better. And that is why people are more likely going to opt into the model because in the end of the day, you can at least do something, right? Now onto political change. Our strategy here and our path to victory here was as such. We prefer having more action that looks like lower threshold and break down the problem so that you can choose the easiest to realize. We think it is far more better to have divergent attention than like concentration on this one issue and all the resources concentrated on this one issue. Because in the end of the day, the amount of support is probably symmetric on either side of the house, but it is about lowering threshold that it actually results into action. The problem on their side is that we have awareness, but that does not translate into action because people don't want to make the economic trade-off. In their best case, even if, if they do reach a Paris agreement, right, they still 
transgress five of these planetary boundaries. And that, is, that means that fishermen on their side are still jobless and children still die of cancer pollution. But the trade-off here on their side is that either you get no change on their side because the burden is way too high and the threshold is way too high, or you get some changes on our side, even if they're minor. Lastly, on co cooperative incentives. We think this is incredibly important for in today's debate because what NGOs are doing in phase two is not enough. The WWF cannot implement policies, right? They only get, like, we get more investment on our side. This is why they can push companies to do certain things. On their side of the house, NGOs cannot solely fix this problem. But at least, in our worst case, we still don't get greenwashing. That means they cannot just plant trees and pretend they're carbon zero. They cannot, uh, because we have awareness for other issues, if they're polluting groundwater, if they're polluting the soil. Therefore, because we care about the niche issues and the most vulnerable individuals, incredibly proud to propose. Um, the speaker spoke for eight minutes and 14 seconds. Um, may we proceed to the next speaker? Okay, uh, may we now have the third speaker from the opposition to deliver their speech. To be very clear, this debate is not just about awareness of the nine planetary boundaries as a theory. It is about the adoption of this framework on a federal and intergovernmental level, which means that the vast majority of side propositions case so far is still uncontentious within the realm. All of the things that they're talking about, the strategies that they concede are currently effective, all of which we can co-opt on our side of the house. Things like providing cheaper carbon neutral transport, things like alternative products that fit the current framework for a carbon neutral society. On our side of the house, all of these are strategies that currently the environmental movement are already using to great effect on either side of the house. But on their side, what we explain is that the environmental movement is made far less popular and we flip their claim on public support. The last -ditch response that we get from third proposition is just to say that, well, in the discourse about environmental change, it's a trade-off between carbon emissions and the nine planetary boundaries framework. We agree, and that's exactly why we are having this debate. We think it is incredibly important that we have a consensus within the envir international environmental community that carbon emissions is, in fact, the most important issue that we have to solve, and we cannot have a, con a, a lack of concentration of resources. But at the end of the day, their burden is still unproven within this round. It is not true that individuals currently view the environmental movement as too extreme or too radical or too difficult. This is an incredibly disingenuous characterization of the status quo. What we have seen in the last two decades is exact proof of the opposite, which is a dramatic rise in global environmental protection, the rise of things like green consumerism, for instance. In international conferences like Paris, Kyoto, and Marrakesh, in the recent COP27, we are seeing the rise of developing, developed states taking upon the financial burden and relieving them of these developing states. At the end of the day, the status quo was in fact currently or on, on, on the track to solve this environmental crisis, what side proposition does is take a radical diversion away from this success and propose an entirely speculative and entirely unsuccessful policy. So with that being said then, I'm going to talk about three things in this speech. The first thing I want to talk about is specifically what this, the importance of funding is within this round. The reason why this issue of funding is important is twofold. The first thing that we explained is that current efforts to reduce carbon emissions, while they were working good, were not working well enough. The IPCC, the Global Authority on Environmental and Climate Science, says that by 2030, we need to have, we need to halve global carbon emissions. By 2050, every city in the world, in every country, needs to be carbon neutral. We are currently nowhere close to that goal for the exact reason because funding is something that is currently scarce. This, what this proves is that on side proposition, we don't have the luxury of time of deciding within the scientific community whether or not specifically picking one of the nine planetary boundaries is something that we ought to do. We already have a clear goal that we're not currently meeting, which explains why the funding needs to be concentrated even more on our side of the house. Secondly, what we explain to no response is that when you lack a concentration of resources, that makes every single policy on side of the of proposition ineffective. We think the real harm that they need to engage with is that if they fail to protect one of these nine planetary boundaries, they can't just reverse time and say that the environmental movement is going to start again and pick the correct one. Once they spread these resources 
thin over a range of different issues. They are going to fail in every single one of those because each of those is incredibly expensive. The largest threat within this debate is that side proposition strategy of trying to win all of these single issues means that there's a large likelihood that they lose it all. And the reason why this is important is because they never actually explain where they're going to get the, getting this additional funding. We pushed them as early as right. possible opposition to explain if this was such a big issue and we needed government to do a like, drastically different solution, then how are you going to get this money? They had to concede that you're taking it away from current successful efforts that we already explained was, it was not working sufficiently enough for carbon change. So at the end of the day, it is unclear why at best side proposition is able to solve the problem they're able to get, especially because we don't respond to this funding point. But importantly, what we explain is that regardless of whether or not funding is going to be true and whether or not the research is valid, we explain why the nine planetary boundaries is not the correct scientific framework on which the environmental community needs to do this. The reason why we explain this is because it does not pose an existential threat to some humanity. So even if you concede side property in case and accept most of these things to be true, if they are somewhat important, that still doesn't prove their burden. With, right. limited, with the amount of limited resources, we still need to, as the environmental community, direct this towards the most urgent problem that is facing our society. So clearly, this framework at the end of this is still deeply speculative and still, as they concede, unpopular within the public. Their justification is that, well, the politicians are, don't, don't believe it and the public don't believe it because they have short termist interests. This is probably true, which is exactly the reason why that scientific community has not done anything to change that. At the end of the day, the way in which our society is working is going to be far better. But I always want to be very clear here that in comparison, our mechanism is our mechanism of things like graph. Their mechanism, sorry, of things like graphs and models are just completely symmetric, right? So when they say things like we're going to paint a picture of what this looks like for the and make it easy for the average consumer to understand what the real problem is in their societies, we think at best that is something that we can do as well. But importantly, they explain that the problem is you know they at no point do they propose actual tangible policies in addition to this. So if they have a problem with things like fertilizer, for instance, because they're caused to like the nitrogen content within the soil, then that means their burden in this debate is to prove why instituting things like why scale bans on certain fertilizers was something that was necessary for these communities. What we explain is that this disproportionately and unjustly hurt things like agricultural communities, for instance, who rely upon that sort of fertilizer. They don't have a response to this and instead default to just taking on a softer burden for themselves and saying that we do not have to defend wide scale policy changes. If they don't, if they're not willing to defend wide scale policy changes, then their case has no impact at the end of the day and they're still going to be facing a climate disaster. Sure. How exactly is dying because we don't have any more fresh water not an existential threat as you claim? Dying because we don't have any fresh water is not something that is directly facing the cut, like the, the world in this debate. Like it is actually not true that we just don't have enough fresh water for enough people to live. But importantly, what we did explain is that specifically the environmental movement has to focus on what is the most important. So using a vacuum that fresh water is important still does not disprove the burden of explaining why that has to be the priority and expense of the carbon emissions that is directly the, the biggest problem. The next thing that they say in response is just to say that well, environmental protection is something that is interconnected, which means that different parts interact with each other. The first thing that we, uh, we want to point out here is that obviously we completely agree with this because what we explain is that carbon needs to be the priority now and that once we are able to fix that on our side of the house then we can afford to fix the others because it's a matter of urgency second proposition saying that well they can just do climate change as well because the framework is one that is holistic and it is one of the nine doesn't actually work right Firstly, because that concedes the importance of prioritizing based on the metric of what is the most pressing and rather that and it proves that their metric of holistic protection is not something that the international community should adopt. That is something that is inaccurate and we do in fact need to make a choice and some sort of trade-off. The way in which you adjudicate this is twofold. The first thing that we explain is that we proved in first opposition quite clearly why carbon emissions is the largest problem facing humanity nowadays. That it is a tipping point that the IPCC has specifically identified that the melting of things like you know in, in Greenland and, and the Arctic in of the ice cap was incredibly important towards rising sea levels for instance. The deforestation of the Amazon forest has a knock-on effect on all of the other eight planetary boundaries on our side. So when you concentrate resources specifically into carbon emission policy, that is better able to protect them in the long term as well. So we echo all that benefit in the long run. But why does third proposition saying that you know they don't have to do all at the same time actually hurt their case? Because what this suggests is that if they don't have to do all at the same time and they can just pick one that is the most pressing, then their problem statement in this debate is literally nothing. If it is the case that you can have the luxury of time to just pick and choose specific points in which you're able to do things when it's convenient for the public and when it's most persuasive for politicians, that suggests that their problem in this debate, that they say there's a mass environmental catastrophe, isn't actually a real problem and they're just incredibly hyperbolic. 
This, in this specific context, that explains why the comparative that we still identified on our side of the house, in which things like NGOs are still going to play a significant role in the protection of things like deforestation, for instance, in the protection of you know, fish, fishes and like the fishing community, are still going to be relatively effective. At the end of the day, they still don't respond to the real human cost that their burden requires them to justify. The entire communities are reliant upon the sorts of boundaries that they want to radically change. At the end of the day, it is not a strategy which, we should, which the environmental move, movement should adopt because it is important for us to recognize the urgency of this issue. The speaker spoke for 8 minutes and 17 seconds. Judges, may we proceed? Okay, we will now move to the reply speeches. We will have, now have the opposition reply speaker to quote the case. Make no mistake, this debate is not about whether there are other problems with the climate. There was a specific comparative between two strategies. On opposition, a necessary focus on reducing carbon because it necessitates that this is the thing that is going to hurt the climate the most and because it was able to increase the amount of participation for the movement. On proposition, a strategy that will divert resources away, that will confuse people on the best way to help the climate and will otherwise take away resources from the things that we need to do the most. Team Germany has been incredibly dismissive of the harms we outlined in all three speeches. If we did not deal with the biggest threat of carbon emissions, they manufacture a monumental catastrophe of their own. It was places being flooded, it was climates being worsened to the point where any forms of biodiversity they wanted to protect could not live. It was where land reform usage may be preserved in the present, but in the future they'll be eroded away by a climate that is increasingly growing worse. The problem with their case is they don't explain how they are able to deal with the largest threat of them all, and we prove why it's compromised on their side. There are two strategic observations of the proposition case which clearly lose them the round. The first is, I want to note how soft line and marginal their impacts become down the bench. At first, it's about you pending the monopolistic damaging practices of corporations and how they destroy the planet and stopping the uh, other forms of the climate from becoming worse about how they're able to stop the extinction of species. But at second, it's just about graphs and awareness, about marginal changes to how people are able to better see how the environment is being harmed. At third, it just becomes, well, you can pick and choose which of these climate goals are those that you want to meet the most. But the reason this doesn't work is their burden necessitates a massive shift in how resources are used. Their rhetoric makes them need to have ways in which resources are going to be used to different levels and not just one issue, which is that that we identify which is carbon reduction. So if we agree that one of these issues were more important than others, we explain why that's more aligned with the strategy on opposition. Secondly, all their argumentation actually leads to a singular and very fragile impact of more people buying into the movement. But we explain why this has the opposite effect on their side. Because when you say, not only are you held to account for one environmental standard, you're going to be accountable for how you're able to affect the environment in nine different ways. And we explain why even if people are able to make contributions in one field, it would be discredited. Which is why their case is just about individual participation and how the movement should frame that, and not one supporting the planetary boundaries, which is why there's no impact in this debate. First, I'm talking about policy priority. I think it's quite telling that their only nuance comes as new material in third prop, which is that different countries suffer from different issues. But we are willing to take the trade-off here, because even if you could not deal with the small issues we explained or that, that, that happened on their side, we said two things. First, that the trade-off was necessary because the harm of climate emissions was someone that was global, which all countries were going to be suffering from. But two is because we already explained how niche groups can deal with this better, because ultimately they are less resource intensive than carbon, which is why carbon reductions needs to be prioritized as a global agenda, which we did not hear a response to. What were the impacts of this? It was that you get less participation and resources going into the movement as a whole because the priority of the environmental movement gets shifted and people aren't able to invest in the solutions that we need the most. Solutions like climate technology, like solar panels which reduce our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. Second, on political and economic blowback. Once again, proposition needs a taste of reality. Their burden necessitates a massive shift, but they never explain how they're able to get this massive shift. We said, because of the high changes they wanted to make, there will be people resistant towards this. Specifically people on the ground who cannot meet the high burden that they wanted to set for them, or also corporations who now be held to account for nine different standards. For now that even if they reduce their carbon emissions, we are still willing to tax them for other issues as well, which turn us away from participating in the movement. The only reason we got to where we are today was because of years of scientific consensus and research, and they would discard that on their side of the house for speculative science. 
Finally, our third substantive on how this threatens survival of vulnerable human communities. This went completely unresponded to on the side of proposition. The reason why this is important is twofold. First, they fail on their own metric of human protection, as we outlined the end goal of all planetary preservation is human lives. But secondly, it means that you engineer another form of political ammunition against the movement. Because people are able to say, look at the movement, they are casting the direct lives of people in the present, and we cannot let this happen. For these reasons, the ballot has never been fairer for opposition. The speaker spoke for 4 minutes and 19 seconds. Uh, may we now have the reply speaker from the proposition to quote the case and the debate. Hannibal, I hope you're all pretty excited about the idea of a world where, sure, we might die soon, but at least we're all driving funky Teslas as we drive around the world of chemical pollution, ecosystems imploding because of biodiversity, and everyone dying because of malnutrition. Before I go to the main strategic flaws, let me point out the main deltas in the two policies as these seem to be, or, or in the like, way that go uh, governments work on both sides of the house. On our side of the house, everyone begins by, be ch by changing the behavior on the issues that are closest to them, right? We give them another way of accessing the environmental movement. This is something that opposition cannot provide to you because you have to tend to climate change. And if that, like, uh, if that like, limits your abilities to either on an individual level change your life and not get to work anymore, or in the, uh, on a political level, like changing your economy, completely stopping to rely on industrial-like economy, which is extremely worse in especially developing nations, right? Like, and especially like also when it comes to like creating fake solutions, right? That this is also prevalent on our side of the house. Then I think it's very clear, right? And they tell us that it's not enough to do one, right? This becomes sort of like over time, slowly, like everybody's like, okay, well, you have to do more now, you have to do more now. We don't understand why this is bad because this just changes the game theory on like a global level, right? Everyone is now operating with more things on their shoulders, right? So we don't understand like throughout their entire bench why this is exactly bad, okay. The strategic flaws they make are, firstly, like, they throw this whole point about like awareness into like the side corner, like, oh yeah, you know, they just get awareness. They don't understand that our entire, like, the, 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 the magnitude of this awareness translates into literally companies being checked in completely new manners now, governments being checked in completely new manners now, your friends being checked in completely new manners now, their entire, poli they, like their entire world relies on the focus on one thing, right? They can't just be like, oh yeah, we get the same thing. No, panel, there is a difference between the existence of this information and the access to this information, right? There is simply more, like, like, yeah, we, we talked about this, right? From my first speech on, there is more, like, attention to this in the media, in whatever. They neglected this, right? And they just threw it into the corner. Let me go into the main clashes. First of all, on consumer level change, right? They never really engage with this, on, on, except for the point where they're like, oh, yeah, like, it, people are going to be overwhelmed. Okay, first of all, right, it begins with a single thing, right? Okay, because there's, there are many, many people around the world that are powerless right now. And they, like, cherry pick this point of, like, eating meat, which is already on their, like, uh, on their, um, which is already something that they promote, right? But we give you multiple examples of other things that you can do, right? That don't fall into the category of um, of climate change, right? And they keep discrediting our science, saying it's just yeah, it's not entirely proven, whatever. And they literally like by doing this, I mean, because we know that these are planetary boundaries, right? We just haven't ex and, like understood at which point exactly they call the tipping point, but we do know that they do call the tipping point, right? Which means that we need to take further investments in them, right? And by just saying, oh yes, this is like science that we haven't entirely researched into, they're just proving that we need to do more of this, right? Second of all, right, they, they tell us something about setbacks, right? They tell us that we're going against political progress, and like, they, they kind of drop this in a second and then pick it up, like, they tell us that this is a radical diversion from success, right? First of all, this is not like this is not true at all, right? We're building on global awareness that was created by the by the by the global movement, right? This is very clear. And the analysis that we give you here is that company uh, that countries and this is like in hand with our uh, argumentation, right? We tell you that company uh, countries do the things that are closest to them. So if countries have been working on climate change for the last ten years, they will continue to do so, right? Uh, there's no like pressure on them to divert because that's the thing that's closest to them. Everybody does the thing that's closest to them. That's what I tell you from first on. And then lastly, on climate policy, uh, policies and like private companies, we tell you why the WWF is not doing enough right now because otherwise the thing wouldn't be in the red zone, right? But on our side of the house, because of the attention, these companies get more funding. And these, uh, the, the, the things finally get policies, right? And the third argument on like monoculture or whatever, our second literally talks about a mega dam that like stops fish from going down the river, feeding monocultures, and 
this is all a result of like fake solutions because no one's checking the government on making the right solution on making sure that other boundaries aren't harmed. For all these reasons, we are very proud to propose. The speakers vote for four minutes and 12 seconds. Thank you everyone for a most enjoyable debate and will now ask everyone to leave this room for the judges to confer and arrive at the decision. Debaters may have crossed the floor in 15 minutes.